In talking about the mantle, I want to um, speak about how the, there is a Babylonian garment, a false mantle. Tonight, at least, that's my intention. Where's my wife? I need my glasses. They're in the um, jacket. Let me get them. Is that them? Yeah. Everything starts out of relationship and uh, never has there been a time when relationships haven't been needed in the body of Christ. Years ago when I came in in the 70s and the early 70s, there was a, uh, everybody seemed to be on the same page and uh, we were all running after the same thing, but now there's just such a disjointed message and the trumpet is making an uncertain sound for sure. Uh, and what is it calling people to? But God's ways are eternal. And God has a way of doing things contrary to no matter how we speed things up electronically or no matter what we do in our lives to become faster, bigger, and better at everything, God has a way. And so many people try to take shortcuts to that anointing. Never in my life have I seen such a group of unqualified men and women uh, in the ministry. I'm talking about unqualified. Most of them are self-appointed. And as we read last night, no man taketh this honor unto himself except he that is called of God as was Aaron. So Aaron's calling then becomes very, very important. As we understand the order of Aaron, we can then proceed out of that to the order of Melchizedek. There will never be an order of Melchizedek until we are operating in and walking in the order of Aaron. There are so many places where the Hebrew word translated mantle is used, but it, it always speaks of a garment or a coat or some kind of clothing. But you know, uh, the mantle is simply a type of God's anointing, God's authority. It's like the Jesus, Jesus when the woman tried, she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will get my deliverance. There wasn't anything, you know, and now you've got people that are so-called wearing the talith, and some people actually believe that that was the mantle. Uh, but, I mean, who knows? But some people make a God and worship the robe of Jesus. It has nothing to do with the actual robe, but everything that that robe signified. Everything that the mantle signified is what we want. And so 
um, it even goes back to, you know, the, the little coat that uh, Samuel's mother made for him every year, which speaks to us of growing and growth. She made him a little coat, or it's the same Hebrew word, for mantle. <clears throat> every year. If you're going to wear the mantle of God, there has to be change in your life. You can't be, you know, you can't settle on your lees. Moab has been at ease from his youth, Jeremiah 48, and he has settled on his lees. Therefore, his stent, or his scent rather, start to say stench, scent remains in him. And he is not changed. And I don't know if you can smell spiritually, but when you're around some people that are not truly in the flow of God, there is a certain thing that they put off. And it stinks. And the longer you hang around people that are not stirred up, but are, have settled on their lees or have given up, pressing toward the mark for the prize, then you're going to become like them. That's why it's vital that all of us remain in fellowship with one another. We may not agree with each other on every blessed thing. Some people raise their children a certain way, and you would never do that. But, you know, let's be careful, you know, when we come to our judgments. Really, I'm telling you, uh, our judgments can be so cruel and uh, bitter and resentful in talking about other people. It's become... Uh, just part of the body of Christ to speak of and to criticize other people. But Hannah made a coat for Samuel every year. She made him a little manual in hopes that one day he would have the mantle of a prophet upon him. But here in Joshua 7, you know this story well. We find the sin of Achan. God had told them, don't take anything from them. Especially the accursed things, their silver and gold, or their garments. How can you sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How can you have God's anointing when you're wearing a mantle that is not a mantle from God? Many people are doing it today. It's a wonder fire has not fallen from heaven and consumed so many people. Because we're not doing it God's way. Everything is birthed out of a relationship. God does not want us submitting ourselves to men that we do not know. As we said this morning, you know, Timothy knew Paul's manner of life. He knew his ways. He knew everything about the Apostle Paul. But God says, don't touch. It's called garment there, Babylonian garment in Joshua 7, but it is the same word translated mantle. But it was something that God 
did not want his people to even touch. He called it an accursed thing. And believe me, any man that boasts in a false gift, Proverbs tells us, is somebody that is like a cloud without water and traveling like, you know, uh, wandering stars. A man that boasteth of a false gift. If the plumb line was to swing today, and it is doing that, and many ministers are leaving the ministry because they frankly don't have the goods. The proof is in the pudding. You either have it or you don't. And if it comes to to leading worship and to counseling people and having a heart for people, you know, what does it say in Hebrews 5? That high priests were ordained for men in things pertaining to God. Everything in our lives that is pertaining to God and that we have a need to have direction and to know, that's what a high priest and minister is for. But how was Aaron called? It was so beautiful tonight because when God told Israel to clothe, make to make Aaron's garments... Make them for glory and for beauty. How, and uh, I taught you this many years ago, how that uh, literally the congregation weaves the clothes of the worship leader. And you did it so wonderfully tonight. But Aaron would pass his coat down, which was a type of the mantle. So much so that they were told that as the sons of the high priest, they had to wear that coat seven days. Or they couldn't minister. Now, I've known people, it was for consecration and dedication and sanctification. We wear that coat because something about that man breathes into our life. Affects the very fiber of our being. I'm not just talking about any men or men or man or woman. I'm talking about true men and women of God. We even have now in the body of Christ in fringe elements, you know, people that lay on the graves of old men of God that have passed on, hoping that they'll get his anointing. It'll come up out of the grave to them. That's just plain stupidity. Charismatics are some of the stupidest people I've ever met in my life. Some of the most gullible people ever, but it's really because they have no leadership. Nobody to point out the obvious. You just don't lay on somebody's grave. How's that? Get up, dust yourself off. It's just plain stupid. And when they claim that dust particles are angels in meetings. Trust me, when you see an angel, there ain't no dust about it. Everything in you is going to scream out. Because I have seen them. I've danced with them. 
And it's a sacred and holy experience to do that. But we're so void and lack of anything supernatural happening today that people just jump. But it's all, see, and then it's like, you know, we want to rail against that, but really it's all gone. He's just letting the earth do their do. And all the while he's choosing a people for himself. The Lord's eye is on the nations. And his eyes are upon the faithful of the land. How can God judge faithfulness but where, where it comes to faithfulness in our personal lives? Faithfulness with one another. How can we be faithful to a God we cannot see when we cannot be faithful to a brother or sister we do see? Achan took of the accursed thing. I'm not going to read the whole thing because if I do it, I'll get caught up in it and start defining all the names and uh, the objects and just we'll just be lost in a crazy foolishness. But suffice to say, Achan's name means serpent. Treacherous. But guess what tribe he came out of? The tribe of Judah. Now, God forbid, standing here tonight, maybe there was a praiser that has the spirit of Achan. <laughs> maybe there is snake in. I'm feeling a witness here. Ooh, my hand is burning. You know, that's where you were sitting, Pablo, right there when you first came and I came off the platform and called you out. And he was leading worship in a 10,000 member church and, you know, but nobody knew his personal life. <laughs> nobody knows any of our personal lives except who we choose to submit ourselves to. And they said, well, who's your shepherd? Or who's your covering? Jesus, of course Jesus is. But who really knows you? Who knows your problems and your areas of weakness? It's supposed to be a relationship. You know, it says... Uh, in the book of Proverbs, that the glory of old men is their children's children. No, how does that read? Let me find that. I believe that's in Proverbs. What is that? It's either 17 or 20. Let me find it for you. And, uh, oh, somebody pray for me tonight. I'm just a little weary, but I have this word burning in my heart that I need to get out. I need to deliver this baby. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Proverbs 17, 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, 
and the glory of children are their fathers. See, a true, a true father wants to see his life reproduced not only in his son, but his son's sons. And what's supposed to be the glory of young men was supposed to be everything that is important and means something to them is their father. Did you hear what I just said? Yes. Glory to God. I believe there's another uh, passage. It's in Proverbs 20. I would like to look at just in a quick second. Just Proverbs 20. Oh, I have to keep looking at it. Proverbs 20, I think it's 24. No, is that Proverbs 20? No, but it's not. Can't even read my own handwriting. Maybe it's 29. It's in Proverbs 20. It should be 29. Yes. Oh, my. The glory of young men is their strength. And the beauty of old men is the gray head. You know the passage that we used to quote around here, despise not the hoary head. There needs to be more of a reverence for those that have gone on and accomplished the things of God. We need to honor old men. I don't say that in a self-serving way because actually I'm only 63. And as Jenny keeps telling me, that's not that old. I keep trying to tell my body that, but <clears throat> she's 80-something years old and told me tonight she's doing better than she's ever done. And I'm like, Jesus. She's got me by 25 years. You know, her mother lived to 108 or something, wasn't it? Jesus. She, she comes from that strong genetic chain. My father died when he was 56. My mother when she was 70. This, you're supposed to add those two together and divide them in two. So that's 126. I'm supposed to be dead this year. That ain't going to happen now. But I'm just saying 63 is... Two times 63 is 126. So whatever. But God promised me on a 188-day fast that I would live to be 88 years old. So praise God, I got 20. You're going to have to put up with me for 25 more years. <laughs> Jesus But even in the children of the tribe of Judah, we find Achan. He just saw that Babylonian mantle and wanted it. it. Says he coveted after it. Glory to Jesus. But what he didn't know while he carried and went and hid that mantle is that it not only affected him, but everybody round about him. People started dying of the children of Israel and they were not used to losing battles. 
They weren't used to losing and being killed that they were being at the mercy of the people that they fought. They always won. And so Joshua goes before the Lord and he says, he fell on his face and said, God, why have you forsaken us? And God spoke to him and said, get up off your face. Somebody disobeyed in the camp. They tried to get something away in a way that God never intended. Did you hear what I just said? They tried to get something in an order that God had not ordained. And people lost their lives because of it. People are not, when you say, you know, I I believed in the restitution of all things that God is going to one day just restore everything. But they lose their reward. They lose the opportunity that they could have had to be something in God because somebody else is teaching them the wrong thing. Glory to Jesus. Out of the tribe of Judah, which Jesus sprang out of, it wasn't our enemies that reproached us, that did us harm, but we're wounded so many times in the house of our friends. God was so concerned about this, he told Joshua, I'm going to call every tribe, and then I'm going to call the families in that tribe, and then I'm going to call the men in those families, and I'm going to have them come before me one by one until I point out to you the culprit. God is going to point out the culprits in these days coming. Just like I said this morning about how the children were torn. Breach uh, emotionally ripped up. How do you think you can minister when you minister out of a breach and you're ministering from everything broken up inside of you? No minister's perfect until that day comes. But I mean, at least, my God, you have something in you that you that's whole. Amen. You don't minister your wounds to other people. Amen. And it's happening far too often. And the answer is very simple. We just need more fathers. And we just need more obedient children. Because the obedience factor is going to be one that every one of us will be tempted in in our life. Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present age. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life all speak of this present age. Some people, you know, it's like Saul when uh, Samuel's mantle was ripped and torn and he didn't get Samuel's mantle. Even after all that, and God judged him and took away the kingdom from him, his response was, well, come and honor me before the people. What about being honored before God? We always try to make holiness some kind of natural thing that we do. But more than anything, holiness begins in the heart of men. And if you cannot stand before the Lord with the right heart, 
You have no business standing before people with a divided heart or a double mind because that person is unstable in all their ways. So God had to judge Achan, but as soon as he got... And the thing is, Achan lost his family. Can you imagine his little children? Stoned, burned, all because of what their father did. Too many young men and women are being stoned and burnt because of what their fathers have done. You ought to say amen to that because it's so very true. That's why such, such a tremendous responsibility is placed on us as men of God. I mean, oh Lord... Sometimes I just really shake my head and say, God, I just don't know. You require a whole lot. There are no examples anymore. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Sheep are wandering and scattered all over this country in particular in the world because of one simple reason they don't have a shepherd or they the one that God sent to them they said to him go up thou bald head or they didn't recognize his headship or they didn't like something about him or they found some fault with him are y'all listening to me you can find fault with anybody if you look at them long enough. I tell people all the time, listen, you don't know the half about me. But I am who I am by the grace of God. I did not call myself. I did not take this honor unto myself. God called me as he called Aaron. And I have tried to be as faithful as I can to the men that, and women that God has placed over my life. I've always honored them and respected them before they went on to be with the Lord. Both of my, uh, my father in the natural in the sense of uh, brought, bringing me to the Lord, but now Mark Hamby is bringing me through the ministry. Both of those men, Dan Duke and Mark Hamby, are in their late 70s. And I've had a relationship with Dan in particular for almost 50 years and Mark for the last 15, 20 Do I agree with everything that they do? Absolutely not. But I agree with who they are in God. And I recognize when I hear Mark Hamby speak, I hear the voice of God in that brother. Just sitting talking to him, more revelation is flowing than sitting in a conference somewhere. But God has to judge these men and women because of their, they haven't been they haven't done it God's way. They haven't been faithful. Now they said of Achan, they called it, because where they stoned him became the Valley of Achor. Mm -hmm. 
And I've said something a few times here the past couple of days that I want to kind of visit again and say it in a different way. We will do everything we can to forgive and restore somebody. Do we have any scriptural examples? Yes. John Mark. Paul was so upset with John Mark that he told Barnabas, I'm not going on another missions trip with that guy. If you gave me a million dollars, I'm just not going to do it. And the dissension, the Bible calls it dissension, was so sharp between them, it parted them. But at the end of Paul's life, he said this, Bring Mark with you, for he is profitable to me in the ministry. And just as we saw this morning at the word tear, what that literally means is at the end, it, it means win. There's no problem about these people repenting. That's going to happen. But whether they're restored to ministry is another subject. But there's hope. Say amen. There's hope that they can be restored. Because that's always the heart of Jeezy. 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 That's the heart of Jay-Z. Jeezy. Oh, I told you it's so easy to find something goofy about me. Jeezy. Mercy always rejoices over judgment. God's way is the love of God. Redemption, restoration. But these folks are going to have to come to themselves like the prodigal did. And they're going to have to go through literal hell. And trust me, when we see them and when we greet them, everything may seem to be going great in their lives. But emotionally, they're being torn up on the inside. You cannot walk away from the call of God without suffering some kind of breach or tear. And you don't walk away from your father and not feel something. But, see, here once again, Achan, where they stone him, becomes the Valley of Achor. And what does Hosea chapter 2 tell us about the Valley of Achor? It's a door of hope. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray, I, I, you have no idea how I really pray and hope with everything that's in me that... And I believe all of these folks will come back in in the last great move of God. But whether God appoints them or allows them a place in ministry, it's up to him. And I think that John Mark had to prove himself to Paul. But what happens... When you're carrying around a mantle that's a phony mantle or a mantle that is not of God, you have to justify yourself. Because when you come in the presence of someone who has an actual mantle, trust me, it's obvious. Now I know that thou art a man of God. Why? Because my daughter, or my son rather, has been restored to life. Miracles follow the mantle. Amen. 
But see, that man's life is infused in that mantle. Do you understand that? With the, the mantle that Elijah wore, he wore it and, and, and wore it through uh, all of the drought and being by the brook Cherith and then, uh, you know, defying King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and standing up in front of all Israel with that mantle and repairing the altar of God and, you know, coming against the nation of Israel and saying, how long halt ye between two opinions? Having to take those stands, that mantle was there with him that whole time. And then what about when he called down fire from heaven and consumed 53 times? When they presumed to command him to go to see the king. How about the mantle was with him? Obviously, we know for a fact when God, when he went into the wilderness, he became very depressed sat down under a juniper tree and wished that he would die. I want you to know that that mantle was just as effective and around him as it was in the glorious times. When you wear a man's mantle, you're not only wearing a mantle, but you're wearing that man's life. His life is infused in that thing. Everything he ever suffered, everything he ever prospered in or gained is in that mantle. It's in that anointing, that calling. And it was there when he thought that he was the only one left. All the people of God have turned to Baal and there's not one left and now they seek my life. And the Lord quickly reprimanded him and said, no, there's 7,000 people who have it. You're not, stop thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You've been living alone here for so long that it's rubbing off on you. We start thinking pretty desperately when we're by ourselves all the time. Don't have anybody to judge it to or by or so on. But the mantle was with him when God said, I want you to step outside this cave and I'm going to speak to you there. The mantle was there when the fire came. The mantle was there when the earthquake and the shaking came. And the mantle was with Elijah in Horeb, that waste howling wilderness, that place of desolation. You got to carry that mantle through everything, good times and bad. And that mantle was there with him when he heard the still, small voice. And he wrapped himself in that mantle. He wrapped his face in that mantle. He covered his face because he was actually trying to cover his soul. As if God couldn't see right through it. And the mantle was there with him when God said, I want you to anoint Yehu, king over Syria or whatever, or Jehoshaphat, uh, king over Israel, and I want you to anoint Elisha in thy room, or instead of you. You know, the first thing he went to do, he didn't go anoint any kings. The Bible says he went and found Elisha. Glory to God. 
Because Elisha wasn't one of the sons of the prophets. He wasn't part of the religious community. Elisha, Elisha rather, was just a very wealthy man who had plenty of oxen, was plowing his field, and he with the twelve. Now, all of that has very great significance. And here's the thing about him. He came from the place called Abel Mahaloa, whatever it is, which means meadow of dancing. He's the son of Shaphat, one that judges. He didn't come from a bad family. He wasn't poor. But Elisha knew who Elijah was because of that mantle. Oh, you need to hear that again. Elisha knew who Elijah was because of the mantle. And when Elisha passed by Elijah, I'm sorry, Elijah passed by Elisha, and it says he cast his mantle upon him. Elisha immediately, in the, the King James, the Hebrew reads there, he ran to Elisha. Something just happened to me. Don't have any apparent needs. I'm well taken care of. Don't come from a bad background. Have people that work for me that are under me. But somehow sovereignly he knew that because of that mantle being cast on him, that he, it was going to cost him his life. Yes, I will leave everything and come follow you. Just let me say goodbye to my parents. Yes, we nowadays don't want to pay a price for anything. People want everything. They'd rather pay money for something than work for something. Jesus. Glory to God. And Elijah said to him, what have I done to you? See, here's the thing. Every one of us are going to have to make that decision. The man of God cannot answer it for you. You have to do something about it. What have I done to you? See, he passed him by. But somehow instinctively Elisha knew that that mantle meant that he was going to have to follow Elijah for the rest of Elijah's life. That he was going to have to pour water on his hands, that he was going to have to serve him. Now we got to teach 10 weeks on servanthood to get people to just serve. And even then, you don't know if it's going to happen. Can you imagine what Elisha's parents said to him? First of all, if it's actually true that Elijah only wore the mantle... You know, some people wore it as an outer coat and a garment and all that because it was ample and it was big, you know. 
But they say, and it did, you know, there seems to be some historical tradition to it, that Elisha just wore that exclusively, and he was naked underneath it. Now, somebody walks past me and strips down and throws something on me, I'm going to fight him. I mean, I might not be able to fight too good now, but I can sure pick up a rock and throw it at him. That dude just got naked and threw his shirt on me. <laughs> the hell does that mean? But he knew ex instinctively. How did he know that? Well, he knew of Elijah's reputation. We're sure about that. How did he know it? Because when that mantle touched him, it was so infused with the... Oh... It's so hard to separate, and it's got to be done. In many cases, it has to be done, separate the man from his calling and all of that. But that mantle was so infused with who Elijah was. He could tell this has come at a great sacrifice to this man of God. I just want to read to you, and I'm hurrying, so hang on to your head. Just want to read to you two passages of Scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2, These are those who have a false mantle. Verse 10, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. That's people in authority. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes." sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, who was a false prophet, by the way, the son of Bozar, who loved the rages, the wages, of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in air, while they promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus, and they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Glory to God. Let me just read to you one more passage of Scripture. I 
I pray you all are getting something out of this. Whoso, this is Proverbs 25, 14. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Jude, if you can, because Jude describes these very same people. Or as John says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Glory to God. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Likewise also, verse 8, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. They have no problem. Look at me. They have no problem coming against people in authority. They think that they can just sit there and run their mouths, but God is watching. And everything we say against about somebody that's in a, a place of dignity or a place of, that God's called them to ordain. Look what happened when uh, Moses' own brother and sister came against him. Look what happened to Korah and his entire family. Who made you judge and ruler over us? They think those things when they don't, when they're not in the flow. As long as they stay in the flow of right relationship, are flowing in the glory. Oh, come on, somebody. Do I have to explain this? Are flowing in the word of God, staying fresh in the scriptures, staying humble, staying sweet. You can't imagine what these people can turn into once they give heed to that seducing spirit. Filthy dreamers. They despise dominion and speak evil. They have no problem sitting there pronouncing all manner of evil and darkness over men of God's lives. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil himself, disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they naturally, what did I tell you? Having loved this present age. But these as natural brute beasts speak in those things that they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Anytime you find somebody that's greedy of gain... This is their testimony. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. These folk will be tormented in their lives because they have fallen out with the man of God or the woman of God. Now I know some people are going to say, well, what you're saying is very radical. And, but listen, I have lived my life in the kingdom of God and I've watched it, how things are circular, things always come around. And I'm telling you, I see it clearer today than ever before. 
I've seen it hundreds of times as in the 70s, in the 80s, and then in the 90s, and in the early 2000s, and then between 2010 and now. I've just watched how this happens. How people who loved you, respected you, and honored you now are your arch enemies. And the thing is, they may even have a valid reason in the sense of somebody did something wrong. But they, because of having loved this present world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, something about that is speaking to them, and they don't want to pay the price anymore to walk holy before the Lord or to walk in submission. They want it all, and they want it right now. And so they appoint themselves and they take that honor unto themselves as was Aaron. Aaron, Jesus himself did not take that honor upon himself. He waited till God Almighty gave him the call publicly. before, And it always comes publicly before people. Elijah did to Elijah what he did publicly where everybody could see it. Well, I think I'm stronger than... (laughs) These thin, weak arms... We're under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Galatians 4. This is what it ends up saying. Whereby the Spirit of God has entered into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. What was that passage about? You know, it says the... the, honor of old men is their children's children but the glory of young men are their fathers what respect and honor that needs to be given these men of God if I be a father where is my honor Paul had to constantly defend himself for who he was and it should have never happened because the world was not worthy to receive that brother If you only knew what this ministry has cost me personally. This is the cry that should be in every one of our hearts. My father, my father. The chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. The Spirit of God is crying in our hearts, looking for our fathers on earth. And frankly, there aren't enough of them, but you in this place have an inheritance that is so vast, so big, and so mighty. We're talking about Uncle Arthur who lived with Smith Wigglesworth. He was my mentor for 35, 40 years. Derek Kuhn, Chuck, Prophet Chuck Flynn, who was around in William Branham's days. Sister June Lewis, one of the greatest teachers of the scriptures I've ever known. Dr. Eva Evans. Bishop Thomas Weeks, who is a tremendous man of God. Bishop Hamby and Brother Dan. And then last, and hopefully not least, me.
That's, and the brothers and sisters around you are that inheritance. Who they are and what they are makes Narrow Way Ministries International or Narrow Way Ministries who we are. We're not just out here fighting against the wind. We're not here beating the air with our fists. No, we're not some wild splinter group off some cultish, even though we've been called every one of those things. No, we're under authority. And we're trying to do it the right way. Hallelujah! Stand to your feet tonight. We've passed through a serious storm, or storms plural, but as was prophesied this morning and as, as it is found in the Song of Solomon, lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The time of the singing of birds is come. And the voice of the turtle dove, the Holy Ghost, is heard in our land. We need to be getting ready to enlarge the place of our tent, enlarge our stakes. Because I'm, I say this to you humbly, we have come through. And every one of you have passed your test. You. Not that you won't have any more. But you passed this one. <laughs> Hallelujah! So, who do you think, if, you know, if God's going to make his choice, and I'm not saying we're anybody, whatever, but if he's looking, you know, around and he says, okay, narrow way there in Jacksonville, they're faithful. Narrow way in Bolivia and in, in La Paz, Cochabamba, Santa Cruz. There's some faithful people there. And God's trying to select for himself a bride or a remnant of people that he can reveal his glory through. The only thing we're going to have to endure is the ranting of the 50 prophets standing on a hilltop far away, viewing from afar off what you and Elijah are doing. They're not going to be a part of it. Costs too much. Can you imagine? You can't get across the Jordan and Elijah slaps the thing and it parts and then you walk across on dry ground, but guess what happens? It fills back up again. The only way back across that water is to have the same anointing that Elijah has. Where's the God of Elijah? He's with you right now and he's in that mantle. Oh, hallelujah! And it has nothing to do, and then I believe this is in particular with Narrowway Ministries because there is not and never will be a racist bone in my body. It is not about the color of anyone's skin or the gender of their race. Is that right? Gender of their bodies? What would I say about that? Their gender? Period? 
Gender, okay. It has nothing to do with... Oh, Lord. I goofed up again. I'm sorry. We love black people. We just absolutely love brown people. We just absolutely love red people. We absolutely maybe have a few issues with some white people. <laughs> But hear this, in Jesus, you have to forget your own people. Isn't that what the bride says in Psalms 45? He tells her to forget also thine own people and thy father's house. We are in a new kingdom now. It's the kingdom of God and we're all the same color. And it's the color of glory. And I believe that we're going to set the standard all over the world and let people see and know that those people have entered into something that the rest of us should have entered into. Glory to Jesus. And all the while keeping us knowing that what do we have that we haven't received? Keeping a heart of humility, remembering the rock from whence we've come from, all of that stuff. Because it's all about Jesus and his kingdom. Say this with me. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Be the king of narrow way ministries. Never let Jesus fall from his high and holy place. Oh, come on, let's give him a clap offering. Yeah.